Uh, so our next presenter knows a thing or two about huge infrastructure. Jack Levin was an early employee at Google and later started Image Shack and most recently is at Inventify. And it's a privilege to have him speaking today, giving all that perspective going back to the early days of Google up to today. So thank you, Jack. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm super excited being in New York. That's like really only my second time in New York ever. Thanks, uh, Evan, to, you know, for inviting me. So my presentation, presentation is a little bit different. Uh, I was uh, privileged to be at Google from uh, 99 to 2005. Uh, essentially, in the beginning of my career, I was about 23 or 24 years old when I started. And I'm here to talk about scale. Uh, what it means, you know, how to actually scale large systems and not essentially, you know, burn yourself out and burn infrastructure out. So after Google, I did spend some time uh, actually running a company called ImageHack, uh, doing about 2 billion web hits uh, a day, which was a pretty good scale story in itself. So um, onward. So that picture actually is of a rack that I uh, built myself. Uh, it happens to be in the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. Uh, you can see that uh, little label there, JJ17. So I put that label there. Uh, it has some of my blood DNA because you can see like this, this thing is a mess. And I often would uh, scratch my hands on that, um, that network card right there. So that was my first day at Google. Essentially went into the data center, had to wire all this, bring it up you know, online. And a week later, we needed to uh, essentially launch Netscape.com, which was like the first client, you know, a really big client at Google. So 300 servers, but then the next week it was like plus another 2,000, which was crazy. And I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, Larry Page said, hey, here's a bunch of cables, plug them in, you're good to go. So, uh, and that was kind of like a story for the first couple of years. A uh, few years forward, Oops. A few years forward, that's when I stopped going to the data center because, well, clearly uh, it was like a team of like 25 people managing all this. So uh, that's the second or maybe third generation of Google Racks. So tons of hardware, a lot of kilowatts being consumed, a lot of you know, heat being generated, but you know, and a lot of queries being served. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, disasters. So I claim responsibility for killing Google myself with my bare hands a couple of times. Uh, you know, uh, basically we didn't know what we were doing. I clearly did not know what I was doing. I would push the wrong button, Google would go down. And I would jump, jump, jump on my uh, motorcycle or scooter at the time and literally run to the data center, unplug all the power supplies and put it back in to wipe out my configs and everything would come back. So that, that happened a few times till I figured out, well, perhaps I should have like a dial up into a data center so that I can actually dial in and undo my work. But you know, that comes with experience. So uh, moving forward, Let's see. oops. So we had a team of really smart people uh, when it came to development, but we had no clue in operations. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. The guys who were hired were mostly IT people on the corporate side. Uh, so basically, one of the bigger problems that uh, startups that need to scale up quickly, well, the problems that they experience is that they, they get, they're not IT people, they're not operations people, uh, the founders that is. They hire essentially guys to run their data centers, but nobody knows what they're doing or nobody knows what the pain points are, so on and so forth. So for the longest time at Google, we actually did not know what might kill Google, right? We had a bunch of monitoring, but we didn't really know how to interpret it. So one of the interesting things, like the way back in the day, in about the year 2000, the way you would kill Google is that you would send it a query something like theological cellulite. So the words that have no meaning that are combined together, but what Google would do, it would actually search uh, 
all the way to the bottom of an index. And if you send five queries per second from your laptop, you can actually kill the whole Google search engine. So that was an interesting thing. And we learned that, well, monitoring of queries and kind of like spam detection is really important. So there you go. Uh, that's uh, actually one of my favorite slides. So it's not specifically about Twitter, but back in the day, you guys know that like Twitter would go down all the time. You know what's going on? Why is it always down? So uh, interesting thing about Twitter is that it's not the language that was like Ruby isn't bad and Python isn't bad. What it is is just Twitter kind of like should I say fly away from <laughs> the company that tried to build it. Uh, they just got so popular so quickly, and it was very difficult to scale. And sometimes it takes like luck and persistence and people working more than nine to five, you know, like 24 hours, several days, just to get things up, up and running in the right kind of way. And 80% of the time, you just don't get it right. So uh, this is kind of like mostly about the ops teams. So a lot of these startups, when they hire their ops teams, they actually don't uh, claim responsibility, and more often than not, it's because they are somewhat a disenfranchised group. Most of, most of the people who call the shops are DevOps and founders, and operations folks are just like, you know, they're trying to run things, but they're kind of like not really on the forefront of the, of the company business. So uh, uh, this slide is basically talking about, okay, so postmortems are very important. So when things break, you actually do need to talk about them, and you need to have your peers kind of discuss them. But more often than not, you need to think about the future. What can possibly go wrong? So that's a, that's a pre-mortem. So pre-mortem actually can help you to envision the possibility of different kind of disasters that, that you generally don't think about it. But if you, if, you, if you don't think about it, then likely it's just you know, not gonna work for you. So, Early years at Google, I had no back out plan. It's not that I like to live dangerously. I mean, I just really did not know what I was doing. So uh, back out plan is very important. Right now uh, at Inventify, the company, the second company that I, that I co-founded, uh, it's very important for, uh, for me like, to ask my engineers, okay, so you're gonna make all those changes. Do you have any idea uh, how to roll back? And usually the answer that I would get, well, I know what I'm doing, but more often than not, that's not the case. You need to have a backup plan. How to scale. So that quad quadcopter, I actually seen it at CES, is pretty great. So great <laughs> picture of a scale right there. It actually does work. Uh, so when do you scale and how? Uh, interestingly enough, most of the building blocks that you need are already available on GitHub. So if you just go to the GitHub, get your building blocks downloaded and you know, tried by your engineers, uh, it, there's no point rebuilding the whole, you know, the whole thing, especially if it's not your core business. So the company really should be focusing on the core business and not necessarily inventing the new building blocks how to build stuff. Uh, surprisingly, you're a better engineer if you know how to use Google. Uh, you can find a lot of things that already been solved. So. Using Google is actually is a skill that every engineer should have. Uh, that's a very important uh, slide right here. So NIH stands for non-invented here. So a lot of the bigger companies, when they scale up, they usually have one or two people who, who say, hey, we never want to buy anything. We don't want to get anything that's open source. We just want to create everything locally so that we know exactly what's going on with our libraries. That's often a fallacy. And it actually is expensive and slows down your progress and ability to deliver product to the end users. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about the future. Um, I would say uh, clearly it's cheaper and cheaper to store your files. Likely uh, all of the companies, great companies that you see on the screen are competing against each other. Um, likely in the future within, within let's say five, five or 10 years, uh, the cost of storage is gonna be, you know, go down to zero and you will end up actually paying for something else. Uh, the way I see it that, especially with Google efforts of delivering fiber and satellite connections everywhere, and so is Facebook, uh, very likely that everybody's gonna have free internet and just be essentially plugged in. Uh, 
that's an interesting concept. So we talk about uh, storage nodes, and we talked about it at Google as well. So what likely we're going to see between five to 10 to 15 years are storage nodes that are actually, should I say, self-aware or driven by conditions and somewhat like an AI. So this way, like if you go on the plane and you have your data with you, it's not gonna be on your phone, but it might actually be following you from the terminal into the plane, load up on your plane, and like all of your movies and everything you have is like right there. So I call it AI-powered peer-to-peer storage nodes. It's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, there's more and more interesting, uh, interesting technology being developed when it comes to consuming data. So specifically, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, interesting car windshield glasses. There's like talk at Google about contact lenses that can uh, uh, kind of create this sort of a VR feeling right in, your, right in your eyes rather than wearing anything. So you just wear contact lenses. Uh, so this is Google Glass. Uh, currently, we use text to query for things and find things. Very likely that, you know, if it's not Google Glass, it's going to be something similar where the visual information itself will be used for search. Uh, this is maybe 20, 25 years from now where uh, advanced nanotechnology perhaps will give uh, people's ability to record all of your experiences from your visual cortex, from your, uh, uh, your feeling of what, whatever it is that you're touching, uh, and essentially, eventually share this data between humans. So essentially data sharing. So it's not telepathy, but more like uh, close range communication mind to mind. And that will be possible with technology. Augmented reality and VR are likely to merge, and we're likely to see uh, absence of keyboards and just using our minds and our hands to manipulate data and interact with data visually. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jack. So in some of the earlier presentations, we've heard